Good morning, AP Physics. We just took our chapter five test number one, and now we're ready to start the second half of chapter five, which deals with friction. You're gonna be seeing the exact same problems that you saw. I mean, more or less, your test might be changed slightly, but for the most part, you're gonna see very similar test questions to what you've already had. Uh, it's just that we're gonna be adding more forces specifically looking at the friction force in each of the problems that we have. So um, that's where we're going with all of this. You can see that I've uh, got a couple labs here uh, labeled. I don't know for sure what labs you're going to do yet on this chapter. Those are just what my vision of how this was going to go. Um, for sure, you'll have the friction on an incline, but I may change up what your second lab is to be something that just looks at a simple physics friction problem. And I'll discuss that as we get into the day stuff. Okay. So that's what we're starting with. Um, sorry here. Uh, nothing better than a, a good pear. I don't know if you guys eat pears, but a pear is either the best fruit or it's the worst fruit. If one's not ready or if it becomes too mushy, they're horrible. But when they're just right, they're just right. Um, ooh. Or the beginning of these slides here. This is the end of them. Bear with me while I go back to the beginning. So you can see everything in reverse. That's okay. I need more time to eat. Good. And you can see that wasn't very many. All right. So friction. First thing we say about friction, it opposes motion. You know that, you understand that, yet I'll bet you that I can convince you on a test question to make friction point the wrong direction. We should maybe put some, put some waders on this so that I could get that to happen. But let's start by just showing you that friction is a, is a force that opposes motion. I don't know that I need to attach a spring scale to this. I don't even know that I really want to use a bowling ball, but I was figuring that a larger object has a little bit more impact. If I, and I don't want this to roll. I want it to slide. So you know what? I'm not going to use a bowling ball. How about our big, heavy iron block that we've seen back since we were sophomores in chemistry? Our old friend, okay? If I want to get this moving, now this is heavy. This thing weighs about maybe 10 to 15 pounds. If I want to get this moving across the table here, and it'd be nice if it had a hook on it, because then we could pull on it with the, with the spring. So I have to drill a hole and put a hook into this. Uh, probably benefit us a little bit. But right for right now, we can envision that it's going to require me a force to get this moving in this direction, right? So if I push on it, the friction is trying to prevent it from moving. It's not just it's inertia, right? It's a friction that wants to not let this get started moving. And obviously its weight has something to do with that. But then if I all of a sudden try to trick friction and then immediately go and push from this side, it still resists the motion in that direction. So as the very first line says there, it's a force that always opposes motion. So if something is moving, even if I let it go and it's moving across the table, the friction is what's bringing it to a stop because it's opposing the motion. If it's moving this way, it comes to a stop, thank goodness, um, because the friction is opposing its motion. So it doesn't matter which direction it's moving. And you understand that, but I'll bet you on a test question, I could word it in such a way to convince you to put the friction force pointing in the wrong direction. And I'll explain of course, I'll explain that to you ahead of time, how I'm doing it. But still, we get to our test day, we get nervous, or we weren't paying attention, or we didn't watch videos, or we didn't look at the notes, and we can convince ourselves to do something that we know is apparently not true. There's two types of frictions that we care about. There are other forms of friction. Rolling fi friction is mentioned in, chapters, in chapter 10, um, but we still treat it the same way. But we really, in physics, care mostly about just kinetic friction and static friction. Kinetic friction is the easier one. That's when an object is already moving and there's the force that's opposing that motion. Static friction is the non-moving friction and it's when we're trying to get it going. Now, the reason why it's more difficult is because its value isn't necessarily what you solve for, okay? It's value. Now I need the bowling ball because I need the hook. When I attach a spring scale to this, and I want to drag this bowling ball across the table, so we see the spring scale here, 
right now with the bowling ball not moving the spring scale only reason it might read anything is just because i'm trying to hold it tight so that it stays straight rather than being kind of droopy one way or the other but really it reads zero right now because i'm not pulling on it and so uh there is no friction force because there's no force to oppose there's no motion to try to oppose so then I start pulling on it. Now, this hand here is not holding it back. It's just to keep the bowling ball from rolling. As I start pulling on it, you start seeing the spring scale reads more and more and more. Okay? So I'm not exerting enough force to overcome the static friction. So therefore, it's not moving. But the static friction can't be its maximum value. Otherwise, that would imply that there's a force in the opposite direction. Sorry, I had a weird pause right there because there's something else I wanted to talk about with the static friction. Where does it come from? But before we get to that, let's go back to what I was saying so we can finish the thought. So as I keep pulling on this, it doesn't move. So static friction has to equal and opposite the force that I'm pulling with. So it's, it varies from a, there's no static friction at all, to until finally when I hit the maximum value, it starts to move. And then once it starts to move, static friction goes away. It's gone. Once an object is moving, then static friction no longer exists. Okay. Now, what exactly is static friction? And also, therefore, what is even kinetic friction? Basically, it's just a static force. Like static cling, it's the same thing. You don't have to draw this if you don't want to. I don't know where anybody's going to ask you a test question or AP question. That's supposed to be flat ground. We put an object on it, like the bowling ball. Okay? And you want to apply a force. So you want it to move. So you're going to apply a force this direction. All right? Now, friction is applying a force in the opposite direction. We tend to draw the arrow a little bit lower because it's really, it's, it's existing right here. So the arrow is usually placed a little bit lower. Not that anybody cares, okay? Now, what static friction is, is static friction is basically an attraction between the two surfaces. You can maybe even almost think of it as those two surfaces. As much as this seems smooth, and this table seems smooth. There are little mountains and valleys at the microscopic level, not even just the atomic level, but at the microscopic level, and they kind of hang up on each other. And plus electrons, the minute any two substances are touching each other that are different, even if they're the same, electrons are being exchanged between them. Well, that's a bond. It's just not a strong chemical bond. It's just a very weak static bond. So these two surfaces, while they're repelling each other, are also attracting each other. All right, and not just talking about the gravitational attraction. We're talking about a electrical force attraction. That's the essence of where, where friction comes from. So that static friction force there is strong because of the fact that they've had time to form a bond. And I mean, that time, we're talking nanosecond. But as long as something's not moving, there is a bond that's formed. Now, once an object is actually moving across the table, Okay, so it's moving. We want to keep this at a constant speed. So really, my picture should have showed these two vectors being the same length, right? Equal and opposite to each other. Um, if something is moving at a constant speed across the table, we would maybe kind of say in simple terms that there's not as much time for those bonds to form. And because of that, the amount of static cling between the two surfaces isn't quite as strong. And therefore, kinetic friction is a weaker force than static friction. How will you know that? The math will tell you, okay? I think I covered everything there. Both of them use the same formula. F sub F equals mu. This is called the coefficient of friction. I don't think I have that written anywhere up in the note, so we better put that in. Coefficient of friction. We're gonna use it so much that nobody in here is gonna have an issue with knowing what it is unless you're just not attending zooms watching videos or doing your homework but i'm not speaking to those people because you're obviously watching this right now coefficient of friction and then fn fn is our old friend the normal force okay so what makes friction forces is number one how smooth the surface is that's really kind of where the coefficient comes into play it's not really a true statement but it's it's a fair statement the smoothness of the surface the roughness of the surfaces and number two uh the force that presses them together now the reason why we talk about it being a normal force rather than just say that the weight of it is is because first of all how would we if we used fg as our explanation for why there's friction what would we do about the fact that if you know in a few minutes i'm going to talk about inclined planes how do we explain 
what is the force that presses these two surfaces together? Now you'd have to call it FT perpendicular, right? So FT perpendicular pushes into the pushes into the incline, and uh, FN is equal and opposite to that. Uh, with it not on an incline, FN is equal and opposite to FG. Wouldn't it just be easier just to say that the force that presses the two surfaces together is always FN? Because FN always equals whatever's happening in the opposite direction. That goes even as far as saying, what happens if we now go to a vertical position? How do we explain that there's still friction as the block wants to slide down? So we know it's not much because the force pressing these two surfaces together is not much. But if I put my hand against this and try to let it slowly slide down the wall, how would we explain how much force I'm pushing with my hand? Well, we'd have to measure it. But wouldn't it be easier just to say in all situations, whatever force presses the two surfaces together, the other surface is pushing back with a normal force. Therefore, it's just easier to use Fn in the formula. If that whole explanation didn't make any sense to you, why don't you just remember that it's Fn that goes into the formula, okay? I'll show you examples of how, how that comes into play as we work through this chapter. Someone wants to push a 100 kilogram box full of books along the floor by exerting a constant horizontal, how about horizontal force of 608. If mu sub s equals 0.6 and mu sub k equals 0.1, will the crate move and if so, with what acceleration? Okay, so you'll notice that the mu sub s and mu sub k are two different values. So the static friction force by nature, obviously the Fn of the, you know, the crate full of books, that doesn't change. It's a hundred, it's a thousand newtons of force holding up the bottom of the crate in both scenarios. So what's different is when I go to get it moving, it takes a lot more force, but once it's moving, it takes less force. That shows up by the different mu's that are there. If that still doesn't make sense, let's write it out. Okay, so this would be in the static situation. In the static situation, here's what I have. A box full of books, FG equals, I'm not sure where 608 is coming from. How about 1000? Therefore, FN equal and opposite. Somebody pulls with a force equal to 608. And then we want to know, is that enough to overcome the F sub FS? Okay. So I really, when I solve these, I kind of look at them more as an inequality. So can I say, is F greater than F sub F S? Is 608 greater than mu sub S times Fn? Or in other words, mu sub S, which is 0.6 times Fn, which is 1000. When you multiply those out, you get 600. And so we can say 608 is greater than 600 Yes, it will move. And yes, you will solve a problem like that on your test. Okay? Even the AP test, that's not an uncommon thing. Now, we know it's going to move. The minute that this block, this crate, breaks free of the surface, mu sub s is gone. Static friction is gone. And therefore, I feel compelled to redraw a picture. And in my second picture, same crate. But this time the crate is moving. So now I'm going to call this moving. You can call it dynamic if you want to, but uh, moving is just fine. Its weight hasn't changed. It's still FG. Its FN hasn't changed. How could we change this FN? What if somebody can't get it moving? So they decide to remove some of the books. Now it doesn't weigh as much. Now it's got a different FN. What if you made the FN bigger by some kid, your little not, snotty nosed little brother who goes and jumps in the crate? It's got to be a big crate to be full of a bunch of books. Somebody jumps in it. Now the FN is going to be different. So we use FN to represent how uh, hard the two surfaces are being pressed together so that we can basically kind of say add up the total weight if it's on flat ground. Um, F, no, not F sub F, just F. And this side here, uh, F sub F K. All right, so now we know it's moving. Now the question is, if it's moving, is it accelerating? Well, it's got to be accelerating because these are unbalanced forces. If they were already unbalanced forces when F sub F was, F sub F S was present, this is certainly an unbalanced force when F sub F K is present. Let's prove that by writing an F net equation. 
up. Really? We still have to do these? Yeah, we're still in chapter five. That we could do these all year. F minus F sub F K. M times A equals 608 minus mu sub K times Fn. That's a time sign there. Total mass, just the crate itself. Acceleration, that's what we're finding. 608 minus 0.1 times 1,000. 0.1 times 1,000 is uh, 100. Subtracted from 608, it's 508. Divided by 100 is an acceleration of about a half a G. 5.1 meters per second squared. Okay. Example two. Last example from this slide. Whew, this is a hard one. This is what I'm thinking that I want to have as a lab for this chapter two because you need to practice this more because uh, this is probably what I'm going to try to attack you with as a test question. One of the hardest questions in physics is a situation where something is moving one direction and there aren't any forces there in that direction. Yeah, I know. See that kind of fake sarcastic smile? So how do we tackle this? You understand this problem inherently. At some point in time, you've been in a car or a truck where there's been something heavy in the back. And when, when somebody slams on the brakes, that object slides forward or rolls forward and hits the you know, back of your seat or the back of the bed of the truck or something like that. You inherently understand this problem. So now we got to see if we can understand the physics of this problem. We want to drive this truck in such a way where that crate that's back there doesn't slide. Okay. So maybe instead of using the truck in the picture that they give me on the AP test, I'm going to take this down to a picture that shows just the crate in the bed of the truck and think about what it's doing. Okay. I thought about it. Still don't know. So the next thing I might do is I might go, okay, well, let's be Zen. The crate has weight. FG. Equal and opposite to its weight, because there's no funny business going on here, is Fn. Okay. So now I got to think about what are their forces. Now, it's a question where a mu is given, so therefore there's got to be a friction force somewhere. So the question is, what direction is the friction force working, right? So now I'm going to teach you this, and you're going to put it in the right location when you're doing your homework. And then on your test, I'm going to write it in such a way where I can get you to convince you to put it in the wrong direction. What a jerk, huh? I know. So let's see if you can beat that. So let's think about what's going on. Is the truck is moving at 14 meters per second. Uh, should probably put a VI next to that, but it's too late. I already wrote 14, didn't leave myself enough room. It's still traveling 14 meters per second, still traveling 14 meters per second, when all of a sudden it slams on its brakes and wants to come to a stop. So now I can do it. VI equals zero, VF, uh, VI equals 14, VF equals zero. Okay? So in order for it to come to a stop slowly enough, we don't want the crate to slide forward. In other words, this is the part that's so hard. We need the static friction force to point this way to, oh, I put a K. We need the static friction force to point that way in order to prevent it from moving forward, right? The, yes, the crate is already moving forward, but it's moving with the truck. So relative to the truck, it's not moving. So now when the truck begins to cause it with a deceleration, and somehow cause an, I mean, I don't, I hate to even use the word force to cause an inertial want to keep moving. Static friction has to slow that inertia down along with the truck, such that both the truck and the crate uh, stay relative to each other at zero speed. Okay. I know, confusing. You know, is what you're going to see. That's why, that's why I broke this up into two halves because the second half of this is so hard. All right, so that's what I have so far. So now, um, hold on really quick. I have to think about something. Ah, good. Sorry about that. 
See what I got to go through? You guys see how this is going here? In the middle of teaching you something, I had to do a quick look to make sure that I had posted my video for a uh, regular physics class. And I was like, crap, I didn't. But you know why I didn't? Because it's only 9.35 right now and it doesn't post till 9.40. Who on earth would start school at 9.40 when we could start it at 9.30? Right? That time's so crazy. Anyway, I'm not supposed to complain. Whenever I complain to my wife, man, she tear, tear me apart for it. Right? I complain. So lucky to have everything we have. Right? We, uh, the fact that we have technology. I mean, what if we were dealing with this kind of quarantine and we were living in a third world country? Right? Her thing is she doesn't talk about that because it's just too sensitive a subject. But she brings up things like, what if you were a POW in a war? sitting in a room, a dark room for hours and hours all day and get one meal a day. I know that's the extremities of the worst case scenario, but I still think that we are lucky. We are lucky that we have this ability that we can do this right now. And you guys can continue your education because life's going to go on, right? And you don't want to be a year set back. You want to go to college and have everything just be right back to where it was so you can get into your career or so you can move back into your parents' house like a boomerang child after you get out of school. So anyway, I apologize for that, but that was one of those quick moments that happened happened that occurred here. Made my heart kind of go stop for a second, like, oh, crap, I screwed up. I didn't. Everything was good. Um, I think I established everything here that I needed to. So what we need to know is what is the minimum stopping distance required so the deceleration is small enough and the crate doesn't move. Okay, so I got to still be zen with everything that's going on here, that there's a money question that is S. And I know the relationship between V's and S is tied up in this equation right here. So if I was tackling this like I did my very first year that I taught this class and I saw this question and I had written it already into my notes and went, I don't know if I know how to solve this, right? Because there's a lot going on here. Now I can talk about it nonchalantly, but even as a new teacher, it's like, I don't, I, I just, you know, there's some, there's, there's some connections that have to be made. They're hard. So I stopped and I said, okay, you know, your skills are there. You just have to figure out the connections. What's the connection? So I started with what's the money question? I need S. Okay. I, I was given motion variables. What's the tie between motion variables in chapter five? Acceleration, right? Because F net equals M times A. So therefore I need the acceleration so that I can plug it into this equation so that I can say zero squared equals 14 squared plus two times whatever A is, and I can solve for S. All right, so now I'm become Zen with the motion equation. So at the very least, even if I can't solve this, then I can at least show the teacher that I know what it's required of me to do it. So now we go to the opposite side of this. Let's make an F net equation. So F net equation. Does the F net equation care about F G and F N? The F net equation doesn't because the F net equation only cares about the direction of motion and R acceleration so if i were to put an acceleration vector into this problem the acceleration vector would look like that negative something right so the acceleration vector is horizontal therefore only only horizontal forces get to go into that f net equation i only see one and what i can see about that force i want to call it negative because of the fact that it's opposing the motion now if that negative is forgotten this equation is going to forgive you It'll all work out. Worst case scenario is S comes out to be the same value, but negative of what it really is. So this equation will work out. But based on the uh, picture and based on the fact that you know you're your teacher, part A, draw the figure, or draw the free body diagram. Part B, write the F net equation. You have to have the negative area on those points. Part C, solve it. M times A equals mu times Fn. Okay, good, they gave me a mu. So I can put in 0.5, I can put in Fn is equal and opposite to the weight of the crate because there's no funny business. And they didn't tell me it. Crap. Okay. Oh, wait a minute here. Total mass is just the crate. So it looks to me that we can say that the M cancels out, which means for this problem, how heavy the crate is doesn't matter. That's weird because in a friction force formula, the roughness of the surface matters and the weight of the object matters to make an Fn. So how can I say that the mass doesn't matter? Because that was just talking about the formula. Now we're talking about the Fn equation, which is now looking at the fact that 
the inertia of the mass wants to allow it to move forward, but the weight of the mass is creating the pressure to not let it move forward such that the ratio of the two to each other cancels it out. The inertia cancels out the mass component of the weight of the pressing together so that the mass doesn't matter. So it wouldn't matter if it's a lightweight crate or a heavy crate, the mass cancels out. All that matters is the coefficient. So A equals 0.5 G, sounds to me like a 4.9 or a five. If you're gonna use your calculator anyway, you can call it 4.9. Um, want to know the difference between a AP physics student and a regular physics student is, let's say that instead you call that one half. You put one half, no, that doesn't work. Maybe it does. One half times G, one half times 9.8. Trying to talk how a regular physics student would talk. They wouldn't screw that up. They'd get 4.9. Where they screw up is, you know, they had to do the same lab as you where it said, uh, one half A equals slope. And then they found the slope on the graph. Let's pretend it came out to be five. So they had one half A equals, sorry, one half A equals five. Then they divided by A to the other side or divided by two to the other side, or divided by half to the other side. Do you know that they'll look at that and call that 2.5, right? So if you're dividing by half, you gotta flip that over and it becomes 10. So I don't know, just a little side comment of things that I have to see. And what's nice is when we're in school, those are easier problems to fix because I have your undivided attention when we're one-on-one -on -one and I'm looking right at you. But when I can't get your undivided attention, then I can't fix that. Right? AP physics students don't have that problem. That's why distance learning works for you guys. Anyway, solving that out, good, good. All right, that was the first half of our uh, today's lesson. The second half of our today's lesson is section 5.7. Is now just looking at friction on an inclined plane. Okay, so when you take an object, we won't use this heavy block because it'll hurt the table. I'll use this light little friction block. Oh, by the way, I guess I didn't mention this. Are you going to be able to see all the way down my uh, my desk here? Get this out of the way. Is maybe we can have a lab that works something like this, where you measure the distance from where. Okay, so I've got a line right here. So I'm going to do this kind of like curling. You know how I like curling when it comes to a stop somewhere. What if you start at a line, so my table has a line right here, and you let go of an object, and you let it continue moving. Now, we want a lot longer distance than that, because somebody standing next to you needs to time you. So I'm going to release it from this line right here, and go one, two, three, tango stop. Then measure out that distance. Have you guys noticed in this class that distance and time can be used to find, I got to look at the camera and smile right at you. Distance and time can be used to find acceleration. We're going to do this over and over again. Are you going to keep fighting it? Or are you going to just start using distance equals VIT plus one half AT squared? And you can use that to find out what the acceleration is. Now, our issue with this problem, though, is there's a VI. So what do we do about that? Okay, well, here's a trick. I'm, I'll walk you through with all the steps to get the answer. But in the end, this is a part that's also hard to get any kind of physics student understand. What if you could work in reverse, right? So what if one now and it's up to its final speed? What if we start with a zero speed and have it go that way back to its original initial speed, but call that the final speed? Wouldn't distance equals VIT plus one half AT squared work exactly the same? Only difference is the acceleration would be positive instead of negative. So therefore, you can just tack a negative sign on to the acceleration if you just think about that problem in reverse. I'm going to write the lab that way when I do it. These are thoughts that an AP physics student has to have. If you want to be an engineer, this is your this is your thinking. Now, remember, you don't need, you don't need to have this thinking perfectly yet because you're not an engineer yet. You got lots of school left, but that's what we need. All right. Sorry, that was a tangent all based on what we want to do on the lab. This block, this piece of wood, ah. okay? Place it on an incline. Place it on an incline that has no angle, zero degrees. There's no reason for this to move. Raise it up to about five or 10 degrees, doesn't move. 15 degrees, doesn't move. 20 degrees, 25 degrees, 30 degrees, 
oh, started to move. And then I lower it down. Did you notice that as I lowered it down, it still continued to move? So it starts to move, watch when it moves, and then watch what I do to the board right after it starts to move. Continued moving, didn't it? So in other words, once it breaks free of static friction, kinetic friction is going to be less. It'll keep moving at a smaller angle. We'll do something related to that with the lab that we're going to have here coming up. So anyway, let's develop how the math of this works. You always have FG. Okay, you break up FG into its two components, FG parallel, FG perpendicular. As of making this video, I haven't graded, I haven't given the test on this yet. So I don't know how good at this, good at this you are, but I'm suspecting you're good. You're a good class. You're a very smart class as a whole. Um, you're one of the best full classes from top to bottom that I've had. So, you know, I'm not doing that to stroke your egos. I'm just telling you the truth. If you weren't, I'd tell you the opposite, just like I did the last year's senior class. Told them how bad they were. Uh, Fn equal and opposite to Fg perpendicular. What is the co? Oh, okay, so a block slides down an incline at a constant speed. We know that constant speed means that no acceleration, but it's moving, right? So if it's got a speed, that tells me that the friction force, F sub F, is a K because it's moving, and then I know that those two things are equal and opposite to each other. So my F net equation simply says F net equals FG parallel minus F sub F K. And by the way, you don't need to put the K and the S on. If you just put F sub F, that's, that's fine. Um, the person grading the test knows which one you're talking about based on what section it's in, and that goes with the AP test as well. Mg sine theta minus mu times Fn. All right, it's easy. Uh, Mg, I could put the numbers in here already, except for I can't because I don't know the what mass of the block. So that tells us something, doesn't it? Minus mu times. Now, what is Fn equal and opposite to this time? Fg perpendicular. You don't have to show all these steps, but at least one time I have to show all these steps. I probably do it more than one time. Fg perpendicular is the formula mg cosine theta. So right there, the mg's cancel out. But I don't trust your math skills because of math 1, 2, 3, 4. So therefore, what I'm going to say is add this to the other side. Come on. And then now you can see easy that mg cancels out. Now we're trying to get mu, right? We're trying to solve for what the money question is, what's the coefficient of friction? So I'm going to divide cosine theta to the other side. And we come up with a formula. Sine divided by cosine is called tangent. Now you don't need to do that. You could plug in sine of 30 degrees over cosine of 30 degrees, and your calculator is not going to say, you dummy, why don't you just type in tangent of 30 degrees? The calculator doesn't care. It's really dumb. It's just really good at math. Okay. It's not even good at math. It's really good at compute computations, right? So it'll do that for you. But either way, you're going to get the same answer, which looks like that. Sample two. Man, the rest of that pair is just sitting there, starting to sweat a little bit, glisten. Just, I'm, and it's like 9.49 right now. I'm starving. I'm going to finish it. Let's get out of these notes. I can finish my food. Five kilogram iron block, well, ours is heavier than five, but maybe not by much, is placed on a wooden board. The coefficient of static friction between iron and wood is known to be 0.55. How do they know that that's what it is? Friction, I was going to say this earlier too, and I, I then got on another tangent. Imagine that. How do you even come up with your coefficients of friction? It's very easy. All you have to do is take an object and do two things with it. You can use a spring scale every single time. Okay, is number one, see what it takes to pull it. Because if you pull it at a constant speed, the force of friction is equal and opposite to the pull. Can I turn this sideways so that I can see, you can see it better? So if you pull it at a constant speed, the friction force is equal and opposite to that constant speed force, right? And then also lift it because the static, uh, the normal force is equal and opposite to its weight as long as there's no static friction. So really what is a coefficient of friction is a comparison of the force to drag something at constant speed compared to its weight, right? In simple terms, in a ninth grade level physics book, they would probably say 
what force is required to drag it divided by what does it weigh is the way that they would describe the coefficient of friction. We can't do that because it's actually, that's too specific a scenario. When you get into other scenarios, uh, there's, a, there's additions and subtractions to that that, that come into play. Uh, it still could be broken down into that simple of a statement, but just not worth a statement to make. But I'd like you to think of it that way. What does it take to drag it compared to how much does it weigh? Whew. FG parallel, FG perpendicular, uh, static friction. We're going to go to the point where there's just the last moment they're equal to each other. And then the FN. I affectionately call this picture here the pinwheel. Because if you draw gravity as a red uh, vector, it's like the handle. And then here's your pinwheel. Remember those little pinwheels, the things that spin around on the wind? That's what our forces kind of look like. Well, of course, the, the wings of it aren't all the same length, but at least two of them are the same and two of them are the same. Okay, so when is it going to move is the moment that in our F-net equation, that F-G parallel just begins to become bigger than F sub F-S. So I'm going to say that while they're still equal to each other, at the maximum angle, the F net still equals zero because it hasn't moved. And then I can put in mg sine theta. And then over here, I can put in mu times mu times Fn. I know I should write this out at least a couple times. Fn is equal and opposite to Fg perpendicular. Fg perpendicular has the formula mg cosine theta. And you can see here that we really just have the same problem as the last one. When you move everything over to the other side, you end up with mu equals sine theta over cosine theta because the mg's cancel out, sine over cosine, which is tangent, and you find that angle. So what that tells us is as long as this is equal, that's the last angle that that's going to occur. And if you go up 0.1 degrees higher, it's going to start to slide. Okay, So any angle greater than 29 degrees. I didn't even write it out as an F-net equation. I just made an inequality on the slides, but F-net equations are better because they're more universal. Last problem. Two kilogram block is placed on a 30 degree incline plane. If it's sliding and mu sub k equals 0.25, what is its acceleration? So the fact that it's sliding, we know it's a k. And if they're telling us there's acceleration, then I think that Fg parallel must be a longer vector than F sub Fk. And then of course our pinwheel is completed by drawing in these forces as well. Okay, so F net equals FG parallel minus F sub FK. M times A equals MG sine theta minus mu times FN. FN equal and opposite to FG perpendicular. FG perpendicular, the formula MG cosine theta. Okay, now. You might notice there's an M, con, uh, M that is common to every single term. It cancels out. Last year's AP class would also cancel out the G's on these problems because they think there's a G common to all the terms. There's not. There's not one on the other side. It would have to be in all three terms. It doesn't matter which side of the equal sign they're on. Things only cancel out when they're found on all three terms. If this had looked like this instead, don't write this down. Ah, then I put, the, I put the exact same thing. Let's try this again. If this had looked like this instead for some reason, which there is no such thing, now the M's don't cancel out because there's not an M constant to each term. The thetas don't cancel out because not only are they not found in each term, they're not even the same kind of theta. One's a sine theta, opposite over hypotenuse. The other one's a cosine theta. So therefore, don't try to do things that math one, two, three have screwed you out of your education on how to do. Those things, math one, two, three, have taught you other skills that I make fun of the ones that you don't have, but there's other skills you do have that other students in the past wouldn't have had. So now we put in 10 times sine of 30 minus 0.25 times 10 times cosine of 30. Solve that out. I got 2.8. You guys have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see you in Zoom.